Hello. Welcome. Welcome to the session on SIG Windows. And uh, the, we're going to do both an introduction and a deep dive into the special interest group for Windows in Kubernetes. Uh, I'll start by uh, allowing Peng Fei to introduce himself. Uh, yeah. Um, hello, everyone. I, I'm Peng Fei. I'm uh, Peng Fei Ni from Microsoft uh, and from uh, Microsoft uh, AKS uh, engineering team. I mainly work for uh, improving the Kubernetes experience on Azure. So I, I, I work some uh, uh, internal work to improve the uh, Azure Container Service and also uh, making some contribution to the Kubernetes such as the cloud provider, the container runtime, the Windows, and so on. Now you're done. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm Craig Peters. I'm a PM in the Azure team in the Azure Container Compute. And I'm responsible for container infrastructure upstream contributions that uh, we, we provide so that uh, Kubernetes and other container uh, workloads work great on Azure. And uh, so what we're going to start by talking about is uh, you know, sort of how we got where we are today. So uh, hopefully you got the contact information, so feel free to reach out to us. We're going to give the talk in English, but uh, we're going to upload the Chinese version of the slides uh, this afternoon uh, into the schedule app. So by tomorrow, you'll be able to download those if you want those. Also, feel free to reach out to either one of us uh, via Slack, uh, Skype, email, yeah, WeChat. How, however, uh, we may uh, scroll back and show our uh, WeChat code here. Also, we, we both have WeChat, so, so you can scan the, the the QR code and join us. I apologize, I won't be able to respond in <laughs> Chinese. <laughs> so, how did we get where we are today? So, in uh, 2014, uh, Windows Container work began. And uh, Docker uh, began the work to enable containers to run. Uh, Docker and Microsoft together made it possible to run containers on Windows. And very soon thereafter, uh, as expected, people wanted some higher level way to orchestrate those containers. So Docker Swarm, <laughs> Docker Swarm. Mesos uh, and Kubernetes have all emerged, and, and as we've seen, Kubernetes has sort of become the dominant uh, way in which to orchestrate containers uh, across multiple hosts. And so very, very quickly, uh, we worked in the community to make it possible to uh, do that in sort of an alpha release towards the end of 2016 in Kubernetes uh, 115. Uh, we worked to solve a bunch of problems uh, that existed in uh, the networking in particular uh, and uh, support the CNI. So uh, I guess the initial release, the key, the key thing is that there was a kubelet and kube proxy ran on Windows. Like that's, the, that's the anchor thing to make the workers uh, in your Kubernetes cluster be Kubernetes, uh, be Kubernetes running on Windows uh, where the master components are still running on Linux nodes. Uh, in 1.9, many improvements were made, uh, essentially fundamentally added CNI support to the kubelet and kube proxy. And so now you can use uh, pluggable network components uh, for Windows. The initial support was uh, kubenet. And, uh, and then people started using it more and more. Uh, in March of 2019, we have we're able to reach the stable label in Kubernetes. So we internally think of this as basically GA. Right? This is something that we recommend that anybody now use. Uh, it's supported with community support. And as we'll get into later, many cloud providers are also providing commercial uh, support for Windows in their Kubernetes offerings. Uh, 114, the, the major things were uh, that we made it easy to use Windows Server 2019, that's the, the server host that is now supported uh, in stable Kubernetes. Uh, that means that we are going to support going forward 2019, Windows Server 2019 and higher. Uh, and then in uh, 115, we made a lot of sort of quality improvements uh, and 
usability improvements. So let's dig a little bit more into what we actually released in 114. So if you're not aware, 114 uh, was dubbed Caternetis. That was the release uh, logo for, for 114. Uh, Aaron of Sigbeard, if you're familiar with him, uh, dubbed it so, and it, it's very appropriate since he loves cats. And uh, releasing Kubernetes as a community project with all these inputs is very much like herding cats. Uh, one of the biggest cats to herd for the release team was actually the support for Windows containers uh, in 1.14. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, for, for, for uh, the, the, the uh, general availability of, of this uh, Windows support, and uh, I think we, we have uh, also send uh, a lot of t-shirts to other contribution that uh, worked for, for this feature. Yeah, we, we, we send a huge thank you out to members of the community. Uh, we had a lot of participation from people at VMware, at Docker, uh, at um, Google, uh, some participation from AWS, and a bunch of other companies all contributed to making this a, a very stable release. The key, the key pieces of that uh, were that we really improved the end-to-end -end testing scenarios. Like that was actually the number one thing that had to happen in order to call it stable. So we have uh, very uh, robust end-to-end -end tests, which we'll look at uh, quickly. Uh, and we did a lot of um, end-user documentation so that it wasn't a mystery how you go about doing this. So upstream we have uh, high quality documentation that if you Use. I hope you'll have a great experience with, and uh, we'd love to you know, hear about your experience with that and get your feedback on that. In 1.15, uh, we have done some bug fixes, and uh, there was an alpha release of global managed service accounts support in uh, Kubernetes that was primarily contributed by, by Docker and is supported through some integrations in Docker Shim. Uh, that has continued to evolve and gotten more mature. It's moving towards a beta release, uh, a beta label uh, in, in coming releases. So this allows you to uh, have pods, have uh, authentication to an active directory so that your host doesn't have to be you know, joined to your domain in order to have uh, authenticated services running in your container. Yeah, uh, so for the next, the network, uh, networking part, uh, since the beta of Windows partner in Kubernetes, we have uh, uh, getting involved the whole community uh, from both the uh, CI, from the uh, network providers such as uh, the Calico, the Flano, and we, we have enabled many uh, plugins to support the Windows uh, Server container. So uh, basically for Windows Server, uh, it, it supports three kinds of uh, network uh, Topology, the overlay, the underlay, and the transparent network plugin. So for overlay net network, basically um, it is based on VXLAN, and uh, you have two choices uh, to, to, to uh, set up your overlay network. The one is the uh, Win Overlay Network plugin. Uh, this is um, a part of the official CN plugin. So so you, you you could find the source code there and the release there. And uh, another one is the uh, Flano support. So if you your cluster may be built today. Uh, already use the Flano, and and uh, when you join the, your your Windows node into your cluster, then you can still use Flano. And uh, another uh, network topology is the underlay. So for for, for underlay, we support uh, uh, actually uh, three kinds of uh, network plugin: the L2 bridge, L2 tunnel, and the Flano. The uh, both the L2 bridge and the L2 tunnel plugin also. Um, part of the official CN plugin. Um, so, so for bridge plugin, it uh, actually works uh, same as uh, the, the bridge plugin on the uh, Linux node. So for the Flano, uh, it supports the host gateway mode support. So uh, th then the same with the overlay setup. If your Linux node have already used the Flano, then you can choose to use the uh, Flano host gateway uh, as your Windows uh, CN plugin. And the last one is the transparent. Uh, so uh, this is based on uh, some uh, the, the uh, Hyper-V uh, V switch extension. So then your container could be uh, connected to your physical uh, network and allocated, maybe uh, manage your uh, 
your uh, containers net network such as IP addresses from your uh, physical network. So for for this model for this uh, plugin, uh, only I, I think uh, open uh, Kubernetes that is part of uh, open base switch. So is the, the only supported uh, plugin, right? Yeah. yeah. And and I want to emphasize that we really also have had a lot of contribution from cloud base uh, yeah, in yeah. the OVM yeah. support as well. So uh, this is a network plugin, uh, which is based on the uh, CI. You know that 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 is standard for con configuring the pods, uh, the networking in Kubernetes. And uh, another thing is a, a network policy. So for network policy, uh, we have got the uh, both the Calico and the Open to support uh, network policy. So for Calico, uh, you know that uh, Calico actually uh, provides two, two kinds of features. One is the, the CM plugin, and the other is the next policy. For, for Windows, uh, uh, Calico only uh, could be run as policy only today. So you can use Calico to uh, manage your next policy, and you use other net, net plugin to configure your network. And uh, Open is actually a, a, a turnkey solution, so it supports both the CM plugin and the uh, the network policy. Okay. Yeah. So when when you set up your cluster and uh, choose your network plugin and and uh, set up uh, your, your nodes, join the, your cluster, then before you running your Windows application, uh, there are actually uh, much thing to consider. So hold on and uh, check and read the uh, the documentation and uh, take care uh, a couple of things before you run your application. So the, the first thing is then, uh, how could you decide uh, your, your container would be run? Uh, is it running on Windows node or running on Linux node? If you uh, need a Windows uh, server node, then you, you should probably use some uh, node selector in your um, port spec. But uh, however, um, your cluster may be, uh, there are already some deployment uh, that are running on Linux node, and uh, those nodes may be, uh, those uh, applications, maybe you, you, you didn't uh, set some node selector there. So sometimes maybe your Linux pod would be deployed into your uh, Windows node, then those containers won't be run there, right? So we, we have two options here. Uh, you can uh, um, make this work. So the preferred one, is uh, add the times to your Windows node. So for your Windows application, you tolerate this uh, uh, tent, then uh, and also you may add the node selector in your Windows uh, application so that uh, they could only deploy it to the uh, Windows node. And also for, for, for existing Linux application, you don't make any changes in, in such a way. And another option, of course, you can uh, make changes to your existing uh, Linux deployment. Uh, you can add uh, the node, node selector to your HAM charts, add, uh, add, add them to your uh, YAML files so that they, they could uh, deploy to the Linux node. So uh, this way would require a, a lot of changes if you have already deployed some uh, Linux application. So uh, that's why the, the option one is preferred. Uh, the, the next one to consider is that uh, as you know, then Windows containers are running uh, actually very different from the Linux uh, container because uh, each Windows container would require some um, backend service to run there. So they would uh, require some resources such as CPU, the memory, and also the, the, the disk space. So if you uh, set the, the resource limit such as the CPU, the memory, then you, you should probably set a, a, a bigger value compared to the Linux application. Uh, the last one is uh, actually the most uh, important one. Then there is a kernel and the user um, version compatibility issues for Windows container. So the, the, the general uh, idea that the Windows kernel version should be um, matched with your uh, Windows uh, container's version. And then if your application is building on Windows Server 29, then your uh, application could only be run in Windows Server 29. Um, but whatever, um, if you have already some uh, application that built from uh, Windows 26, maybe, then uh, 
if uh, you can also enable the Hyper-V isolation. So, so for Windows uh, container, there are basically two kinds of isolation. The process isolation, that is actually same with um, the Linux namespace isolation. So another one is Hyper-V isolation. If you enable the Hyper-V isolation, then you could run the older applications on the new uh, Windows Server nodes. So, so you can run your uh, Windows Server uh, 26 applications on your Windows Server 29 nodes. Okay. It's important to note that that is currently uh, in alpha, and yeah. uh, there's a lot of work to be done to make that uh, a smooth experience. Today, the, the Hyper-V isolation is, uh, requires quite a bit of uh, extra labor, and we're actively working on making that. We'll go into that in a minute. Yeah, and uh, another thing, uh, I, 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 I didn't add that to, to this slide. Uh, compared to the option one, two, 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 select your nodes, uh, the community has also uh, uh, added uh, a new feature that is runtime class. So uh, you can also use uh, runtime class to select your, your, your runtime. So you, maybe your Windows runtime uh, are different from your Linux runtime. Maybe your Windows node have different versions uh, in the future because the Windows G will only support uh, Windows Server 29, right? In the future, you, you, you may have more Windows Server version. So you, you may show the different uh, uh, control runtime handler for, for, for different nodes. So that is another option in the future you can use to select the, the nodes. Okay. So you know, one of the major things that we've spent the last six months really investing in in order to build uh, sort of trust around Windows containers and long-term investment that we uh, are taking in Windows containers Kubernetes is to build a very robust uh, set of tests. So there are many, many hundreds of uh, tests that are run on a daily basis, and uh, it's all on, on test grid along with the rest of the testing in the community. We've worked very closely with Google and VMware to have this testing run on their platforms as well. We're, uh, expecting AWS uh, to join, and we invite any other cloud providers to please join the testing effort and uh, contribute resources and, and run your tests uh, on your platforms as well. Uh, one of the challenges uh, that we face is that um, in the Kubernetes community as a whole, uh, naturally this, this system grew up from uh, assuming Linux as the underlying host. And adding in the notion that you have a different host type uh, or even uh, well, even a different platform uh, has, has been a challenge, right? So if you remember what it was like with Kubernetes and you were trying to run on AMD, uh, then uh, imagine the challenge of, of adding a different host type. The tests are, and the conformance tests also are, are a great example of this. So an active area of work right now is to work through all of the end-to-end -end tests and the conformance suite to uh, get to a shared community definition of what it means uh, to be conformant for different host types. Uh, today, the way in which we're doing it for Windows is to exclude a set of tests that together with SIG testing we have des described as Linux-only tests. That's really a stopgap. That's not really the end solution that we need. What we need is to come to a shared understanding of what conformance means across different platforms, different hosts, uh, as Kubernetes runtimes spread uh, across you know, from data center to edge. There are going to be a very wide variety of runtime environments over time. And so that's, that's an active area uh, of development right now. Uh, we've built a bunch of Windows-specific tests that we've added into the end-to-end -end suite. And uh, ongoing, we're testing uh, 1.14 and 1.15, and, and obviously 1.15 and so forth will be added to the suite. Uh, and, and that's you know, available, and we, we please invite anybody who cares about this to take a deep look and ask us any questions about that. So the next kind of point that I want to make is that uh, you know, in the community, there's been kind of a worry. Like, is, Windows containers and Kubernetes a toy? Is it something that's just a 
experimental thing and it's going to go away. I want to emphasize that this is not the case. There's a huge demand uh, in the, the customer ecosystem for running Windows workloads in by being orchestrated by Kubernetes. And a testament to that is how many different service providers are already providing solutions based on this very new stable support of Windows containers in Kubernetes. So we can see uh, everybody from Amazon, Docker, Google, Huawei, Microsoft obviously, Rancher, Red Hat, VMware, and Pivotal. And I'm sure this list is incomplete. This is the ones that I know about from my interactions in the community. Uh, and we collaborate with all of these people uh, to make it uh, possible. You know, when, you, when I upload the slides, you'll be able to have the links to all of these things. And if your name is not on the list and you want it there, please come. I'll talk to you. You are running your, your Windows uh, containers on Azure. We will also have some uh, open source project to support this. So, so you can set up the, the environment and try it on. Yeah, uh, then yeah, for example, you can use uh, AKS Engine to provision a cluster with both Windows and Linux nodes, and then you can um, read through the documentation and try how uh, it is working. Absolutely. It's a great way to get your feet wet and also to operate clusters in production. So let's, let's kind of transition from how we got to where we are and where we are today into where we're going in the future. And I think they kind of alluded to some of that when he started talking about Hyper-V and the alpha support for Hyper-V. So uh, I'll kind of give a quick overview of, of kind of the big bullets, uh, dig a little bit into what we're doing in Container D and how we're working with Signode, and uh, I think they will take it. So uh, container runtimes, it's kind of an esoteric topic, and not everybody is interested. So you know, our goal, uh, as a platform providers is to make it so that the developer and the operator even don't care about the runtime. It should just be transparent from their perspective. In the Kubernetes community, you know, there's Cryo, there's Docker Shim and Docker Runtime. The huge ecosystem of runtimes. And um, we're seeing that there's a lot of consolidation around Cry Container D as a way to uh, enable the open plumbing of underlying operating system capabilities into uh, the runtime for Kubernetes. And we're, we're putting our weight behind, behind that as well. Uh, the, you know, the things it will help us do uh, will, you know, the primary goal for us is to make it easier to make the Windows container experience as analogous to the Linux container experience in Kubernetes as possible. There are major differences in the way the Windows operating system works from Linux that mean that your experience fundamentally is different today. There are some limitations in the way the Docker runtime works that we can't fix fundamentally. The, the abstractions aren't quite right. And so Cry Container D allows us to do that. But what's happening is that the Docker shim layer will be deprecated, and that is coming. So if you're depending on things that happen in Docker Shim, uh, we want to understand that and uh, work with you to make sure that everybody is ready for that deprecation when it comes. An example of that is uh, the GMSA support. So we've worked very closely with Docker to uh, understand the way in which they're implementing GMSA and the, their customers' dependency on GMSA. And we're working to make sure that, that that support is built into the Cry Container D runtime uh, uh, as well, so that there's a seamless transition for those capabilities uh, as we go forward. There may be other examples that I'm not aware of yet, and, and I ask you to please bring those forward. A another uh, thing that this will do is it'll reduce the footprint, right? So we're going to get you know, one of the things, weaknesses, frankly, of Windows containers is the size of the images and the size of the sheer size of the node overhead that you need to run. And Cry Container D is going to help us shrink that. That's just another step for optimizing everything along the way. It will also enable the Hyper-V isolation, which is a key uh, capability uh, for reducing the sort of user experience friction 
for, for taking advantage of these. We talked about the, the need to have the same base image layer as your host operating system when you're using the process isolation mechanism. Thank you, From the current Docker event, uh, if you are enabled the Hyper-V isolation, then your pod can't be run with uh, more than one container within one pod. But with a correct community, uh, we can add that support because the community is actually based on the, the very new features from Windows Server, Windows Container. This is exactly the kind of plumbing that yeah. container, Cry Container D opens up for us. So we'll have uh, much better storage support. So we're enabling new Windows features to be exposed through Cry Container D. With the Hyper-V isolation, we're enabling new uh, abilities in Windows to control CPU and memory uh, that are not possible today with the current uh, Docker runtime. So the, this is like the biggest thing that we are working on right now. Uh, we, have, you know, we really want feedback. There's, uh, there's an open proposal uh, that I'm happy to share with you. Actually, the link is here about the, the Kubernetes enhancement proposal if you're not aware of the, that process. It's a shared community way to get feedback around major changes to uh, Kubernetes. Uh, and it's all documented uh, in, in the link that will be available. Yeah, OK. Uh, so for the Windows uh, support on Kubernetes, <coughs> so we, we have moved it to uh, JS 1.14. And we have made some group, um, progress in the uh, last week released 1.15. <coughs> Sorry, uh, um, but uh, uh, if you check the, the, the test results we published in the test grade, you may find that some, some test cases are, are still not uh, um, stable enough. Uh, there are still um, many uh, some test failures uh, from time to time. So uh, we, we would like uh, the uh, a contribution from all users. Um, so so from uh, from the uh, community side, we have also a set of uh, steps you, you could uh, contribute. Uh, for example, you can uh, um, use and try the, the features and uh, 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 report your, uh, your, your issues or your use cases uh, from um, the, 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 on the GitHub, on the uh, Slack channel, on the uh, Google Groups. Uh, uh, you can also join the meeting of, of, uh, of the SQL Windows and you can send your feedback uh, you know, um, on all of these places. And also, if you are a developer and you would like to contribute uh, some changes and maybe you have some ideas to propose, maybe it also benefits all of us uh, in the uh, whole uh, community. So in, in such case, you can also uh, make some contributions. Uh, for example, you can send out some changes to our uh, documentation, some uh, Add some missing steps in, in our step-by-step uh, um, uh, -step guides, and also you may fix some bugs. Uh, so we, we would like every kind of, of this uh, contribution. And uh, uh, the uh, the last one, if you have contributed a lot of uh, features uh, uh, in this area, and you would like to help more to get this involved, you can also uh, join as uh, such as uh, the, the Windows. The SIG Windows um, tech lead, maybe you can also mentor uh, someone else. You can help to review and uh, also uh, approve some changes from others. So, uh, so finally, uh, we could make the SIG Windows more stable and uh, make it more, more uh, native compared to the Linux container. Uh, another thing uh, maybe we can uh, mention in the next slide. So. Uh, if you are uh, decided to uh, join the SIG Windows meeting, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's not very easy today, right? <laughs> yeah, today it's very difficult. It's at the wrong time uh, for participants from this region. Uh, and so one of the things that I'm working with the SIG leadership uh, to do is to shift the meeting times in a way where alternate sessions will happen in Europe friendly time zone and then uh, Asia friendly time zone so that every other meeting alternates which will make it easier to have participation around the globe. Uh, the challenge is that currently the two uh, co-chairs uh, whose contact information you'll see in a minute uh, are uh, 
are in uh, both in the North America. Uh, you know, that's uh, just kind of the way things have happened so far. But uh, we're, we're working to change that. And so uh, very soon I'm going to put out a proposal uh, in Slack and via the groups about the time zones. So please, uh, if you want to participate, let your, let your uh, opinion be heard uh, there. Also, here is um, our links in the presentation to the recorded meeting. So if you're not able to participate live, you can always go back and uh, understand the way the conversations are evolving in the community meetings. The link here is to uh, list the recordings of all of the meetings. We also very actively maintain and go through in those meetings a GitHub project board. So the project board is another great way to get involved. The project board has a, a list of all of the issues that we're currently tracking uh, as kind of to do uh, a prioritized backlog for each of the releases. Uh, and we very actively maintain who's assigned labels to those, like, like you know, good first issue, bug, documentation, examples, those kinds of things are also labeled in there. So it's a great place to go and kind of understand the dynamics of what's happening and, and uh, start grabbing issues and, and contributing to them, commenting and doing reviews on other people's stuff. That's a, a great way to participate. Uh, and, and really, this is an ask for me as a, as a product management kind of guy. Uh, I want to talk to you and understand your use cases. Why are you here? What is it that, that you want to get out of uh, Windows in, in the Kubernetes ecosystem? You know, we have, you know, the more information we have about this, the better a job we can all do together to, to solve the problems. So we also have, in addition to us, so Peng Fei is uh, actually a tech lead uh, on SIG Azure. Yeah. Uh, in SIG Windows, he's a significant contributor. Uh, I have no official capacity in SIG Windows, except that I play PM and run around and try to help and close gaps. Uh, but in here, these are the links to, to all of the ways in which you can reach kind of the leadership and the community. Uh, you know, the links will be active in the uploaded presentation. So finally, we've just got a couple of minutes left, and I want to open up uh, the floor for questions. I'm also happy to show a demo later if anybody wants. Are there any questions? Here, let me wait for the mic. Hi. Um, what's the current state of service mesh on Windows? Ah, excellent question. Uh, I, I don't have a complete answer for you uh, because I actually don't know all of it. Currently, there is some work to get Envoy working great on Windows. Uh, that is a work in progress. I think we have early builds and, and it's an area of active development. So once we have Envoy, then that opens up possibilities for lots of other things. There is one uh, service mesh for first proxy that is known to work on Windows, and I can't remember it off the top of my head right now. But we're also working closely with Buoyant and Linkerd uh, to move Linkerd support to Windows. I don't know the time frame for that. Uh, but basically, the fundamental answer is nascent, right? Uh, I'd love to hear uh, your use case for it and you know, what, what you're looking for, because service mesh means a lot of things, right? Are you looking for mutual TLS? Are you looking for north side ingress? And uh, actually, one, one thing to mention that uh, uh, you, you know that many service mesh solutions are based on sidecar, right? Uh, but the sidecar is, is actually sometimes not working on Windows, so we mean, uh, still need some time for Windows container to, to evolve and support. A new feature there. So, right, so actually the also, Pride Container D and yeah. Hyper-V support are kind of yeah. prerequisites for a lot of the sidecar models. Why we, we, we need a, we, we would move to Crack and D maybe to more stable, more features there. The help? Does that answer your question? Great. Other questions? I can ask in Chinese. 就 Windows container 能不能支持特权容器啊？就是 Privileged Container。现在好像是不支持了吧 so, so, so the question is the privileged container is supported on Windows. The answer is today <laughs> privileged containers no. are not. There is an act. So in the, uh, if you go to the Slack channel, there's uh, Patrick has Patrick Lang, who is one of the co-chairs, has posted a proposal uh, for three different options, which works 
exploring together uh, with the rest of the community for how to support privileged containers. This is a, a significant challenge in, in the Windows world. I have another question. Uh, what about the patch management strategy for Windows nodes in, in a hybrid cast? Also an excellent question. So uh, patching of Windows nodes, as you, as you know, works very differently than it, it does for Linux. Uh, right now, we've focused on uh, making that uh, as flexible as possible. Uh, we are defining a key strategy for how we do that in AKS. In, our, in the Azure Kubernetes service uh, today. It's, um, right now, it's left to the, uh, the consumer for, for how to patch their, their nodes. Uh, look for developments there soon. Uh, essentially, you, you really need to focus on treating the nodes uh, not as um, things that you maintain for a long period of time. You need to build your pra practices so that the nodes can go away, and that allows you then to kill nodes and instantiate new nodes with whatever KB and uh, version of the operating system you want. I know that doesn't work for every workload, and we understand that, so we're working on mechanisms for doing patching in place. Do you have anything to add to that? I know, uh, but, but uh, we're, we're a little right. out of time now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great. So. We're, we'll be here all, you know, the rest of the conference. Feel free to reach out and ask any additional questions or please bring your use cases. Thank you very much. Thank you.